Today is the uh, official release date of uh, Bernie's new book, Where We Go From Here. And uh, just looking at the cover, uh, two things jumped out at me. First, uh, Bernie's name is bigger, uh, has bigger type than the title, uh, which I guess means he's made it to the big time. And the second thing I noticed is how Bernie is described on the cover, New York Times best-selling author. There's no question that Bernie's 2016 book, Our Revolution, was a bestseller, and so was the teen version of that book, Bernie Sanders' Guide to Political Revolution, uh, which came out last year. But best-selling author isn't exactly the first thing that pops into mind when Bernie's name is mentioned. How about famed former nine-year mayor of Vermont's most populous city, former 16-year member of the U.S. House of Representatives, and 12-year member of the U.S. Senate who just won re-election to a third term? <laughs> or, or how about former Democratic candidate for President of the United States? <laughs> who who became a sensation during the 2016 campaign, winning 23 primaries and caucuses and more than 40% of the pledged delegates, while electrifying audiences and igniting a political fervor with his anti-establishment appeals. Now, I would bet the price of Bernie's new book, or maybe the price of a thousand of them, that you're all wondering one thing at this point. Will he run for president again? Well, we'll see what he has to say about that this evening. His new book opens, his new book opens with the end of his presidential campaign in, in June 2016 and chronicles the past two years of struggles against Donald Trump's reactionary agenda and in favor of a government that represents us all. Woven into the narrative are the themes and policy prescriptions that have marked Bernie's popular message. Among them, Medicare for all, progressive tax reform, a $15 minimum wage, action on climate change, action on immigration reform, a reform of our criminal justice system, and tuition-free public colleges and universities. This Despite Trump, Bernie actually is heartened by a growing movement of grassroots activists and continues to hold to the belief that, as he says in the introduction to his book, real change never occurs from the top down. It always happens from the bottom up. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Senator Bernie Sanders. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming out tonight. I think we're going to have some fun. I'll speak for three or four hours. And then in the early morning hours, you can ask some questions. But um, The book that I wrote is kind of a personal narrative, gets behind the scenes, talks about uh, my feelings, and it turned out to be, I didn't originally plan it to be that way, but it really turns out to be a sequel uh, to the first book that I wrote, Our Revolution, uh, which Brad was just mentioning. And the book begins, uh, ironically, right here in Washington, D.C., on the night of June 14th, 2016. And that was the night, for all intent and purposes, when the Democratic presidential primary process ended. There was the uh, primary here in Washington, the last primary on a long list of primaries. But uh, from our perspective in the campaign, the campaign had really ended uh, the week before in California. Uh, we had hoped uh, to win in California, uh, which would have given us momentum going into the uh, Democratic Convention. Uh, we started way behind. We worked really, really hard, but we ended up with, I think, 47% uh, percent of the vote. Secretary Clinton got 53%. Uh, 
Um, and that really was the end of the campaign. And a week later, uh, here in D.C., in a hotel room, uh, Secretary Clinton and her campaign manager, Robbie Mook, uh, and her campaign director, John Podesta, sat down with uh, my wife, Jane, uh, and uh, Jeff Weaver, my campaign manager, and, and me, and we had a long discussion about essentially what happens next. Where do we go from here? And uh, the first concern uh, that I had is that I wanted to see us work together, as she did, to make sure that we did everything possible to defeat Trump, and then we had to figure out the best way to do it. And, and it was my view that it was imperative that the two campaigns come together to develop a platform which really spoke to the needs of working families and young people all over this country, a bold platform that could excite people, which I believed uh, would help her to win the election. So one of the things that we agreed on, we began the process that night, is putting together a committee of both campaigns plus people from the DNC, Democratic National Committee, to help us draft uh, the platform. And after a whole lot of work, and I will say that people worked in good faith, differences were resolved in reasonable ways. At the end of the day, what occurred uh, months later in Orlando, Florida, where the uh, platform was voted upon, turned out to be the most progressive platform in the history of American politics. And to me, to me, what was important about that was not just to have a statement that you would uh, dump into the garbage can, which is often what happens with platforms, but it would be something that candidates would stand proudly behind and run for office on. And in fact, that happened in 2016 and certainly in 2018. So one of the accomplishments that emanated from that meeting was a strong, uh, progressive platform. Uh, the other issue uh, that uh, I felt was important to deal with was to bring about fundamental reform to the Democratic Party itself. Uh, and it is, I tell you no secret, uh, when I tell you that for many years, and we have seen some changes, certainly in 2018, positive changes, but I tell you no secret when I express to you that for many, many years, uh, the Democratic Party's uh, business model, if you like, had failed, uh, resulting obviously in 2016 with Republicans, right-wing extremist Republicans controlling U.S. House, U.S. Senate, uh, the White House, majority, significant majority of governors, chairs all over this country over a nine-year period. Democrats had lost close to a 1,000 legislative seats in state capitals uh, all across America. So it seemed to me that it was imperative that we take stock, that we acknowledge the reality, and that is that we need fundamental reforms within the Democratic Party. And again, we put together another committee uh, Democrats like committees, and this one went on and on and on, I will tell you, and I have great sympathy for people who I appointed to that committee. They suffered immensely. Uh, but at the end of the day, a number of months ago, uh, one important reform was in fact passed. And, you know, I fully appreciate and acknowledge that the Clinton people and others were on board. It wasn't something that we had to shove down people's throats. And that was, as some of you may recall, uh, that uh, before the very first ballot in the Democratic presidential uh, primary campaign of 2016, before the first ballot was cast in Iowa in early 2017, Secretary Clinton had assembled 500 super delegates supporting her. And it is, that's well over 20% of the total that you need to win an election. And it is very hard, and Secretary Clinton did not defend kind of the absurdity and the unfairness and the undemocratic nature of superdelegates having so much power to determine who the next 
candidate for president of the United States would be. And out of that committee process, a few months ago, the DNC voted, ended up uh, unanimous, but I can tell you that uh, the struggle was far from unanimous, the end result may have been, to end the ability of superdelegates. And superdelegates, as you know, are uh, often elected officials, senators, congresspeople, uh, governors, campaign contributors, you know, basically the inside elite of the elite of the Democratic Party, that as a result of the decision reached a few months ago, those superdelegates will not have a vote on the first ballot at the next DNC convention. <laughs> and that is, that is significant because you don't want any candidate to start off with, you know, 20% of the vote needed and everybody assuming that the campaign is already over and the money comes pouring in and so forth and so on. So I, I consider that to be a significant step forward in democratizing of the Democratic uh, Party. But clearly, uh, a lot more has to be done. And that speaks to the whole election system, not only the Democratic Party, but the whole electoral system, election system in America uh, today. Right now, for example, in New York State, uh, where most of the younger people, for example, do not consider themselves Democrats or Republicans, but consider themselves, depending on the state, nonpartisan or independent, and yet you have laws there in New York State which make it impossible for you to vote in the primary unless you change your voter identification, I think it's 13 months before the primary. And everybody understands this is nothing more than incumbent protection policy. So we have got to change those laws, we have to change, and we are moving toward doing that now, uh, the caucus laws. I happen to believe in caucuses because I love the idea of people coming out and arguing about politics face to face. I love that. It's something beautiful, it's something we need to do that. You know, all over Washington, D.C., people wear their Washington Redskins jackets, you know, and then they beat you up if you're not, if you support the New England Patriots, exaggeration. <laughs> all right, but, all right, but you know, somehow we're a little bit shy. Uh, and I like the idea of people coming out and talking about why you're supporting candidate X or candidate Y. I think that's a good thing. But there is a problem. And that if a caucus is held on a Saturday night or a Monday night and you're a single mom sitting home, you know, you can't make it to the caucus. So we have to deal with that issue as well. So those were some of the changes. I think a lot more needs to be done to open up uh, the Democratic Party. Uh, the other part of that discussion, uh, needless to say, uh, was Secretary Clinton, appropriately enough, wanted to know the role uh, that I would play in trying to work with her to defeat Trump. And, and I go into this in the book uh, a little bit. Uh, not all of my supporters uh, you know, were great, enthusiastic supporters of Hillary Clinton. That I think we can say. But it was, some of them may be here. <laughs> but it was clear to me if not all my supporters, that on her worst day, she would have been a much better president than Trump on his best day. And I understood that. I understood that, and the vast majority of the people who supported me understood that as well. And I pledged to her that I would do everything that I could in working with um, her campaign, and I ended up, uh, by the election day, it, it, I ended up, uh, over a three-month period, uh, traveling to 13 states, the battleground states, and holding 39 uh, rallies and events for Secretary Clinton and for uh, the Democratic candidates. So we worked uh, as hard as we could uh, to try to see that Donald Trump was not elected president. And I remember, and the book talks about this a little bit, flying home literally the day before the election on November 7th, flying home in a plane and talking to some folks about what we thought was going to happen the next day. And having just, we were on our way back from Nevada where we had campaign, I think it had been Arizona, Nevada. And coming back 
my feeling, my gut told me that I thought there was maybe a three to one chance that Secretary Clinton would win. So my attitude going into election day was I thought she would win, but I would not be shocked uh, if Trump won. Uh, my wife, who is smarter than I am on most issues, she actually thought that Trump was going to win. That was her gut going in. And um, on election night, as I often do, we bring uh, family and friends over to the house to watch election returns. And then what we almost always do is after the returns come in, I go downtown where Democrats are holding their uh, their gathering and say a few words and talk to the media and go home. But on that night, um, I didn't leave the house uh, because, in fact, I was very, very depressed. And I was asking, I think, the question that millions of Americans were asking, and that is, how could uh, Secretary Clinton have lost to a man who was a pathological liar, who was a sexist, a racist, a xenophobe, a homophobe, and a religious bigot. And I think all over the country, people were scratching their heads and saying, how did that happen? Uh, in addition to that, as a United States Senator, uh, I had hoped and did some work in this as well to see that the Democrats uh, recapture the US Senate in 2016, and obviously that did not happen either. So we woke up not only with Trump as president, but with right-wing control uh, over the U.S. House and the U.S. Senate. So, after getting over the depressive aspects of that, it became very clear to me that I and a whole lot of other people throughout this country were going to have to sit down and think, you know, what the title of the book is about is, where do we go from here? And it was clear to me, and I think clear to many millions of other people, uh, that we could not linger in despair or depression, that our task for the sake of our kids and our grandchildren was to stand up and fight back and take on this type of ugly reactionary politics. And that certainly, that certainly was not only, you know, my perspective, that was the perspective of people from coast to coast. And what we understood from day one, that our task was, we were dealing with a president who in an unprecedented way, and I say this all of the time, you know, I disagree with Trump and his trying to throw 30 million people off of healthcare and his tax breaks for the billionaires, and his incredibly ignorant statements on climate change, and I can go on and on. But the thing that galls me the most is that he is doing what no president in my memory has ever done, and that is quite intentionally for cheap political gain. He is trying to divide the American people up based on the color of our skin, based on the country we come from, our religion, our sexual, orientation, our agenda, and we understood that our job was exactly the opposite of what Trump was trying to do. Our job is to bring the American people together, black and white and gay and straight and male and female. around an agenda that spoke to the needs of working families all across this country. And what we also understood in terms of the Democratic Party, that the Democratic Party could not succeed if it continued to be a party of the East Coast and the West Coast and a few states in between that we could not continue to turn our backs on states that were some of the poorest in America, that we could not continue to ignore rural America, that we cannot turn our backs 
on millions of working people who are struggling to keep their heads above water economically, black and white and Latino, that we had to begin the process of going out all over this country with an agenda that brought people together that had the guts to take on the billionaire class that controls the economic and political life of this country and to do everything that we could to transform politics in America. That was our assignment and that was what we had to begin doing after the election. And And I had to make a, a personal decision about whether or not I wanted to become a part of the Democratic leadership. And there were clear advantages to it and there were disadvantages to it. The leadership has a lot of meetings. And if you don't like meetings, it's not a good place to be. <laughs> but I thought, and one of the important points that I want to make tonight is that the future of America is not going to be decided here in Washington, D.C. It's going to be decided at the grassroots in 50 states throughout this country. So I took a position, one of the 10 positions in leadership in the Senate, and took the position of outreach director, uh, which gave me the staff and the ability to start taking our issues all across this country. Now, going back to the end of my campaign and the midst of the campaign for president in 2016, after our campaign ended, uh, Jane and I had a meeting in my home, our home in Burlington, Vermont. And we, thank you for all the folks from Vermont, <laughs> the few, uh, and the, the purpose of the meeting was to ask a pretty simple question, and that is, look, we had run uh, what I think most people agreed was a good campaign, a surprisingly good campaign. Uh, we took on the entire political establishment. We ran a campaign in which we had the support of one U.S. Senator, a handful of people in the House, no Democratic governors, no big city mayors. We took on a corporate media, which at its best was ignoring us, and then it got worse, they started paying attention to us. <laughs> and I think we broke the all-time world's record of having 16 negative articles in the Washington Post on one day. I'm pretty proud of that. <laughs> 16, that was pretty good. And that was their response to the momentum that we were getting. And, you know, there are hundreds of major daily newspapers all over the country, and I'm proud to say that of the hundreds of major daily newspapers, we got the support of one, <laughs> Seattle Times. But the, <laughs> all right. But, uh, you know, when we sat around and, and I brought together, you know, folks who would work really hard in our campaign, and these were people who had been active in the progressive movement uh, in many cases for their entire lives. These were leaders of the civil rights movement. Uh, these were leaders in the women's movement, leaders in the environmental community, leaders in the trade union movement, and other activists. And the question that we threw out is we said, okay, look, we ran a really good campaign. We ended up winning 22 states. We ended up winning over 13 million votes. And maybe most importantly, we ended up getting more votes from young people, people under 30, than Trump and Clinton combined. And we ended up doing something that was pretty profound, and that is opening up political debate in America, I think, in a way that we had not seen for a long time. And that is asking simple questions that had not been asked before because of the power of big money in politics. 
And one of the other things that we managed to do in our campaign is rewrite how campaigns can be funded. Because historically, if you're running for office, the first question the media asks you, well, how much money have you raised? Do you have any billionaires behind you? How many campaign fundraisers have you done in wealthy people's living rooms? And we chose not to have a corporate PAC or a super PAC, okay? And lo and behold, it turns out that there were over two million people who were prepared to make eight million individual contributions at the famous $27 a piece. And out of that, other candidates in 2018, more and more Democratic candidates said, we don't want super PACs. We don't want money from corporations. We're going to ask people for 20 or 30 bucks to help us in a campaign. So one of the other things the campaign did is kind of revolutionize how candidates could raise money without having to be dependent on big money interest. But I think the most important thing, as we sat around that room at our home in Burlington, that we understood is that we had forced the American people to go outside of the media, go outside of what Congress talks about, and think big, not small, to ask questions that are not going to be asked on CBS and not even Fox television. <laughs> to ask a question which is never asked, is it appropriate that three people in this country own more wealth than the bottom half of the American people? Now you could watch, you could watch television from morning to night for years. That question will not come up. Is it appropriate that the top one-tenth of one percent owns more wealth than the bottom 90 percent? Is it appropriate that in the wealthiest country in the history of the world, we have the highest rate of childhood poverty of almost any other major country on earth? Are we concerned that a handful of media conglomerates control what we see, hear, and read? How in God's name does it happen? And I didn't need the UN report on climate change or the recent report that came from 13 agencies of the federal government. I knew and you knew three years ago what the media was not talking about. And that is that climate change was not only real, not only caused by human activity, but already causing devastating harm. Why weren't we talking about that issue? <laughs> so we kind of busted, busted the discussion over, open. And maybe that was maybe the most important accomplishment. That's kind of what we talked about. So people sat around the room, said, okay, we did all of these things. The American people are now asking questions. Didn't ask before, why are we the only major country on earth not to guarantee health care to all people? Why is it that young people are leaving school fifty, a hundred thousand dollars in debt? Why do we have more people in jail than any other country on earth? Why is it that we have millions of people in this country who have lived here for decades who are undocumented, who are scared to death that they're going to be deported? So we asked questions that hadn't been out there. And you know what happened? The American people started nodding their heads and saying, yeah, that's a good question. I hadn't thought about that. Where do we go from here? So as we sat around that room in Burlington for a very long time, we asked the simple question of what happens next? And frankly, it would not have been surprising if we ended up doing what virtually every other losing presidential campaign does. It's hard to run a campaign. And at the end of it, in most cases, people say, thanks, we tried, we lost, we're going home, we're going back to our lives. We could have done that. Not just me, not just Jane, but all of the people, or many of the people who were actively involved in the campaign. So we sat around and we talked. And we said, no, we have accomplished too much. We are not going to do what other campaigns have done, is to pack our bags and going to go home especially, you know, given the crises the country faces, we are going to stay involved. And we're going to continue to do everything that we can, in a sense, to 
move the progressive movement forward. And what was kind of concluded on that day was that we would go forward in terms of the political revolution that we had talked about, which was basically twofold. Number one, the need to continue to fight for an agenda that speaks to the needs of working families. And that is what we have done. And the truth is, I think, as is widely acknowledged, we have succeeded in that struggle. Three years ago, when I began the campaign for president, and I said, the United States must join every other major country on Earth, guarantee health care to all people as a right through a Medicare for all single payer program, Three years ago, people were saying, you're crazy. Nobody believes in that idea that's too radical. It's not what the American people want. Well, guess what? Last couple of polls that have come out on that issue suggest that 70% of the American people believe in Medicare for all. Which is why that concept, concept is attacked by Donald Trump every single day, because he sees the same polls that I see. Three years ago, we talked about the fact, again, common sense, and everybody now nods their head. Three years ago, not a long time, people weren't, saying, you know what? Maybe in the richest country in the history of the world, if you work 40 hours a week, you should not be living in poverty. Whoa, radical idea. Oh, terrible, extremist, radical idea. How can you believe that? And what we proposed, working with groups like the Fight for 15, was that we raise the national minimum wage from a starvation wage of $7.25 an hour, which it is today, to $15 an hour a living wage. And again, oh my God, Democrats three years ago were talking about $10.60 an hour. Not everybody could go that far. Now we got 30 people on board um, the legislation that I've introduced for 15 bucks an hour. But more importantly, all over the countries, you have cities and you have states moving toward 15 bucks an hour. And by the way, you may have noticed that companies like Amazon, with a little bit of prodding, are now moved to $15 an hour. And when we talked, and again, I don't suggest that we were the first people to do this, but we raised it to a different level. And we said, look, we are living, as everybody in this room knows, in a competitive global economy. And as everybody in this room knows, most of the good paying middle class jobs that are out there require either a higher education or post high school training. Everybody knows that. Nobody disagrees. Nobody disagrees that 20 or 25 years ago, the United States of America had the best educated workforce in the world. We have the highest percentage of our people with college degrees. That is no longer the case. So it didn't seem to me to be a radical idea to say that we should make public colleges and universities tuition free and lower student debt in this country. We talked about, I remember this distinctly, because I was involved in that discussion. Everybody knows, no debate, that we have an infrastructure. This is the, the wealthiest country in the world. And yet we have an infrastructure, which is our roads, our bridges. And if you think Flint, Michigan is the only city in America with serious water problems, you are mistaken. We have a rail system way, way behind many other countries. We have a major crisis in urban and rural America in terms of affordable housing. <coughs> and gentrification, might I add.
So everybody agrees. No, no debate about that. I remember a few years ago we said, you know, try to get a trillion dollars uh, to be appropriated for that. And people, oh, no, it's much too much money. You got 460 billion is the best that we could do. Well, even Donald Trump recognizes that we now need a trillion dollars. Terms of immigration reform. You know, while Trump is demonizing in a disgusting way uh, undocumented people in this country, it turns out that the overwhelming majority of the American people, some 80 percent, support providing legal status to the young people in the DACA program. 80 percent of the Americans support that. And a majority of the American people support a path toward citizenship for the undocumented. And when we talked about a broken criminal justice system and more people in America in jail, two million, than any other country on earth, when we talked about police brutality, and when we talked about uh, the fact that the rates of recidivism uh, were so very high, what we learned is that the American people, including many conservatives, understand that we need fundamental reform of a broken criminal justice system, which includes, by the way, ending this disastrous so-called war on drugs, which has destroyed many lives. And the issue is the same. The issue is the same with gun safety legislation. It turns out that a vast majority of the American people support sensible gun safety legislation. Here's my point. My point is twofold. My point is twofold, and, and that is, number one, it turns out that the American people, if you give them options, if you allow them to get beyond Fox News and Rush Limbaugh, it turns out that the American people are far more progressive than the media perceives them to be. So on all of these issues and many others, it turns out that the American people support governmental policies that work for all of us and not just the 1%. So what we felt in Burlington as we discuss that is that we have got to continue that fight, and we have. And I think we have been pretty successful. But what we also recognized is that you can have all the great ideas in the world, but those ideas don't mean anything unless we have people who are elected who are going to carry out those ideas. And that meant undertaking, and, you know, we're in the process, and I think the 2018 elections was a good step forward, but clearly we have a long way to go. Asking questions. Why is it that the United States has consistently had one of the lowest voter turnout rates uh, of any democratic country in the world? Why is that? Why don't we discuss that? And it meant not only taking on, as we obviously have got to do, uh, the disgusting, in my use, and I use that word advisedly, voter suppression that's taking place in Republican states all over this country where political cowards <laughs> You know, I, I've said this many times, you know, I have run for office in Vermont many times, you know, I've lost races, I've won races, but it really never occurred to me, do I, and I think it, it, it never occurs to most candidates that the way to win elections is to try to figure out how you can prevent people who might vote against you from voting. That is outrageous. If you cannot win an election based on your ideas and your character, then you should get the hell out of politics and get another job. <laughs> And you got, then you got, the, you got the issue of gerrymandering, where there are states where Democrats win a good majority, but they end up with fewer members of Congress than Republicans because of outrageous levels 
of gerrymandering. So one of the issues that we talked about in Berlin, all right, where do we go forward? How do you, how do we, in the broadest sense of the word, revitalize American democracy? And that means not only increasing the voter turnout, but increasing public consciousness, political consciousness. There was a poll that came out a few years ago. And astoundingly, it said at that point that most Americans did not know which political party controlled the U.S. House or the U.S. Senate. Right? So we have a lot of work to do just to educate people and to make people understand and to discuss the major issues facing them. You know, the major issue facing this country is not that a caravan coming from Honduras is going to invade America, all right? And we need a lot of political discussion to do that. So out of these discussions came two groups, two um, independent nonprofit groups that I have nothing to do with, I gotta tell you, legally and on, truthfully on a day-to-day -day basis, and that is uh, our revolution was formed. And the task of our revolution was not just to elect progressive candidates, and that certainly is one of their jobs, and they've done pretty well at that, but to, in a general sense, get more people, working people, young people, people of color, women involved in the political process. And they have done a damn good job at that. You know, sometimes media is, oh, they lost this election, they lost that election. That's not the point. The point is that right now, there are over 600 chapters of our revolution in almost every state in this country. And last year, I was here in D.C., and I came to an event that was just extremely moving to me, and I talked about it in the book. And that is our revolution working with another group called Progressive Change uh, had organized a candidate training uh, seminar. And it was a several-day program, and they brought 450 people, mostly first-time candidates, mostly women, many people of color. They brought them here to D.C. to learn the fundamentals of how you run a winning campaign. How do you raise money? How do you do a press relief? How do you get volunteers? All of the basics that people need to know if they are going to run good campaigns. And these were candidates not running for the U.S. Senate or the U.S. Congress. They were running for school board, for city council, for state legislature. And that is, in fact, one of the wonderful things that is happening all over this country. Uh, there was, as you remember, uh, shortly after Trump was elected, there was uh, an election uh, in Virginia where the Democratic candidate won the governor's race, et cetera, et cetera. What was not discussed very much is that a lot of young people running for the first time won seats to the Virginia legislature. And I will never forget, because it pleased me immensely, that some fellow high up in the Virginia Republican Party, he was saying, and I quote, we lost elections to people we had not ever heard of, which I thought was beautiful. <laughs> All right. So what the political revolution is about and what our revolution is doing is doing just that. It's saying to you, you know what? You can run for office. You can run for state legislature. You don't have to wait in line for 20 years. You don't have to moderate your views. You can go out and knock on doors, tell people what you think, and we'll tell you, give you some advice as to how you can do that. And that, in fact, is one of the transformations that we are seeing in American politics. So in 2018, it's not just that we had a much, much, much higher voter turnout than 2014, is that we saw a significant increase in young people voting in that election. And that is an important step forward for the future of this country. So out of that meeting came the beginning of our revolution. The organization was started off by uh, the first president was Jeff Weaver, who had been my campaign manager. Uh, and after he uh, stopped being president, uh, Nina Turner became head of uh, our revolution. And she's been doing a great job running all over the country. Uh, and, and they've had a lot of success. The second organization that developed was uh, a group called, modestly called the Sanders Institute. 
which uh, my wife played an active role in forming. And that job was to increase political consciousness in this country, and in a civil way, really bring out issues and start talking about workers' rights or talking about women's rights or the environment or foreign policy in a way that uh, we had not previously seen. And in fact, just this weekend in Burlington, uh, she's putting together a very, very uh, big conference with some of the best minds, not only in the United States, but from all over the world. So the twofold goal that we had after the campaign ended is number one, to continue the fight, to bring people together, to fight for a progressive agenda. And I think we have done a good job on that. And the second fight uh, is to mobilize people at the grassroots level to get involved in the political process in a way uh, that they had never done before. And that's what, that's what we've been doing for the last uh, couple of years. Now, the other thing that is very important that we also realize, that it's a real, real problem that we have to deal with, and that is the nature of media in this country. And it is not my view. I think what Trump, Trump's description of the media is dangerous, it is anti-democratic, uh, and it is unacceptable, unacceptable. To call the media an enemy of the people or to talk about fake news is outrageous. And by the way, at a time when journalists are being killed all over the world for trying to do their jobs, it is beyond comprehension that a president of the United States would say that. On but on the other hand, what we also have to say is that for economic reasons, I think, uh, the media does not cover, uh, in my view, appropriately, the major issues facing ordinary people. And I think one of the reasons that we have so much political cynicism in this country so the people turn on the TV and they hear a lot of who's going to be running in 2020, who's going to run in 2096, you know. Uh, <laughs> did you hear this about Nancy Pelosi? You know, on and on it goes. Personality politics. Rather than talking about why life expectancy in the United States is actually in decline. Why it is that so many people turn to opioids or alcohol or even suicide in dealing with life in America today. Uh, not talking about uh, the fact that we are the only country not to guarantee health care to all people or income and wealth inequality. So we had to deal with that issue. And one of the things that we did uh, in my Senate office and in my campaign office is to take advantage of the new technologies that are out there. Uh, and that is obviously social media. So we have worked very hard to be able to kind of communicate with the American people about the major issues facing working people and try to discuss a progressive agenda. Progressive agenda is not just a woman's right to choose. It's not just workers' rights and making sure that people earn decent wages. It's not just disastrous trade policies. It's not just the environment. It's not just human rights and a sane foreign policy. It is all of those things and more. And so what we have been trying to do uh, is to get the word out, working with many, many other people, using great articles that appear uh, in the media, the best articles that we can find, trying to talk about what is going on in America so the people see a reflection of their own lives. All right, why is it that I have to work three jobs in order to survive? Why is it that Walmart, which is owned by the wealthiest family in America, does not pay its workers a living wage? We just had a, 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 a video up. It was an incredibly moving video, which millions of people have now seen, about parents, mom and dad, talking about their son, who I think was 26, 27, 28. Young man had diabetes. And he was making money, he was working. But he did not have enough money, he had no insurance, did not have enough money to pay for the insulin he needed. He cut back on his insulin and he died. And that is happening all over this country. Can't, people can't afford the prescription drugs they need. Anyhow, we have worked very hard on trying to figure out how we can educate, how we can speak to the American people. 
in ways other than a four-second soundbite. And we have had some success. So we have a large uh, uh, number of people who follow us on uh, Facebook, on um, Twitter, on Instagram, and we work very hard about that. I'll give you an example of what we have done further and very deliberately. There has never been a town meeting uh, on television, on CBS, ABC, NBC, to talk about the need for health care for all. And I remember this like it was yesterday. I was on a uh, Sunday show, and I was talking to a guy from uh, NBC, and he was asking me about health care. And I said, well, it's a good question. I can't answer it in 14 seconds. But why don't you, and off the air, we talked about this later, and I said, well, why don't you have a town meeting? Do an hour show, an hour and a half show, talk about how our healthcare system is very different from systems all over the world. Talk about why we spend twice as much per capita, why we pay the highest prices in the world for prescription drugs. I can get you some great people, doctors, nurses, people who know a lot about the subject. It's a great idea, Bernie, I'll, I'll move it up the food chain. Well, I don't know what the food chain did, but we never heard back from them, <laughs> all right? So we did that meeting and we teamed up we did it right here at the Visitor Center on Capitol Hill. Uh, and we teamed up with uh, media outlets, online media outlets, Young Turks and others. And we ended up, and we ended up having, uh, I think, a million and a half people watching a rather wonky discussion of the need for Medicare for All. And then we did, later, uh, one on income in wealth inequality. First time a town meeting had ever been done on that issue from the U.S. Senate. And on that night, we had more people watching that town meeting on income and wealth inequality than CNN had on their programming, which I thought was pretty good. <laughs> and just this coming, if I may advertise a bit on Monday night, we're gonna be doing one on climate change. We're gonna to bring together some of the major environmentalists. <laughs> And we do that, we do that because we believe that in this sense, certainly television does not help the American people understand the realities of what is going on right now. You would think that with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and the United States government itself telling us that we have a major, major crisis in terms of climate change, that if we don't, according to the IPCC, if we don't get our act together and radically transform our energy system in the next 12 years, the planet that we're gonna be leaving to our kids and grandchildren will be increasingly unhealthy and uninhabitable. You might think that there will be some major specials on TV to discuss the future of the planet. Well, they didn't do it, so we are gonna do it. So I say all of that because what the political revolution is about is really thinking deep, not stopping your thought. How do people get the information that they need? How does it happen that Trump has his very own television station called Fox News? What does that mean to America? All right. How does it happen that we have so much income and wealth inequality, et cetera, et cetera. So what we perceive our job is, is not to have all the answers, but to at least raise the questions that you're not often hearing from Congress or you're hearing from the American, uh, you're hearing from the media. Now, all of you are aware uh, that we had an election a few weeks ago. Were the results as strong as I would have liked? No, they were not. I would have liked to have seen the Democrats gain control of the United States Senate. Uh, and I say that from a rather selfish perspective. I would have been chairman of the Budget Committee, which would have been a lot of fun. All right. <laughs> Didn't happen. But what did happen is the Democrats won, I think, close to 40 seats in the House, and they will become the dominant party in the House. And for the very first time since Trump was elected, there will be some accountability 
demanded from Congress. So to my mind, it means two things, two separate areas that I think we have got to go forward on. I think the Senate has got to do what it's, it can, even though we're in the minority, uh, working with our friends in the House. And that is, for the first time, holding this irresponsible president accountable. And what does that mean? It means, for among other things, making it very, very clear that any interference with the Mueller, Mueller investigation is an obstruction of justice. And in my view, obstruction of justice is an impeachable offense. I think, and I am absolutely confident, confident that Democrats will do this in the House, take a hard look at the emoluments clause. And that is to ask whether Trump's governmental policy decisions are based on the best interest of the United States of America or are based on the financial gains of the Trump family. Now maybe, Mr. Trump likes authoritarian leaders like uh, Putin or Mohammed bin Salman of Saudi Arabia uh, because they share his contempt for democracy. Maybe that's the reason. Or maybe there's another reason. And maybe there are financial uh, aspects to that relationship that we need to know about. We need to take a hard look, for example, about the disastrous response of the Trump administration to the hurricane in Puerto Rico. So there, there's a lot that Democrats can and must do, in my view. But, in my view, it would also be a very, very big mistake if that is all that they did. And that means that the Democrats cannot simply be the anti-Trump party. And it means that we need an agenda that speaks to the needs of a struggling middle class. Today, the median worker, the person right in the middle of our economy today, is no better off than he or she was 40 years ago. And at a time when well over 40% of all new income goes to the top 1%, people all over this country are struggling. And we have got to come up with policies that address those issues. 60% of the counties in rural America are depopulating. Young people are leaving the towns in which they grew up in. Uh, these are communities that do not have decent paying jobs. Uh, Family-based agriculture is in significant decline. Often these communities don't have decent quality broadband. Rural hospitals are shutting down. We need to rebuild rural America and start paying attention to that very significant part of America. But I think mostly and here's a very, you ready for a really radical idea? All right. We should actually do what the American people want us to do. And that is on many of the issues that I talked to you tonight about, these are not Bernie Sanders' ideas or your ideas or somebody else's ideas. This is what the American people want, all right? The American people, in my view, now we had a, we brought forth Medicare for All legislation, it's a four year phase in. This is what it does in the first year. In the first year, it lowers the eligibility age to get into Medicare from 65 to 55. It provides health care to all young people under 18 and lowers the cost of prescription drugs. My guess would be that if the Washington Post polled that tomorrow, 80% of the American people would support that. So maybe, just maybe, the United States Congress should start, in terms of health care, doing what
what the American people want, and that is moving to a Medicare for all. Maybe we should raise the minimum wage to 15 bucks an hour. Maybe we should rebuild our crumbling infrastructure. We have got to be bold. We have got to understand that there is a lot of pain in this country and that there are millions of Americans who are not staying up nights worrying about the absurd tweet that Donald Trump sent out yesterday or today. They're worrying about the fact that their kids will likely have a lower standard of living than they do. They're worried about not being able to afford health care or prescription drugs. I'll never forget, just a month or so ago, I was in Iowa campaigning there for some Democratic candidates. And we met with a woman who had been working for seven years, single mom, making $8 an hour. Talked to a college professor who had a part-time job at Target in order to pay off her health care bills and her college debt. We got to start paying attention to those issues. We have got to not only investigate what Trump is doing, but expose his lies. Trump ran for president. <laughs> Trump ran for president, and he said to the American people, you may recall, I'm going to guarantee health care to everybody. He lied. He threw, tried to throw 32 million people off health care. He said that his tax bill would not benefit the wealthy. Lie, 83% of the benefits went to the top 1%. He said he wasn't going to cut Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. Lie, his budget, his last budget, called for a trillion dollar cut in Medicaid, 500 billion in Medicare, and 72 billion dollars for the Social Security Trust Fund. So, we have got a lot of work in front of us. I think the good news is the momentum is with us. But we have, we have got to accelerate our efforts. I am very worried about the politics of rural America and our need to get out there and to say to people, do not be supporting a president who is throwing you and your kids off of health insurance. Do not be supporting a party which refuses to raise the minimum wage. So we got a lot of work in front of us. But I do sense that in our country today, we have seen a significant revitalization uh, in the political process. More people are paying attention. More people are prepared to stand up and fight back. More people are thinking big, not small. And I believe from the bottom of my heart, having been all over this great country and talked to so many people, that if we do not allow Trump and his friends to divide us up based on the color of our skin or where we came from or our sexual orientation or religion, if we stand together and fight for an agenda that works for all of us and not just the people on top, I have absolute confidence that we're going to go forward and transform this economy and this government and create an America that works for all of us, not just the few. Thank you all very much. Thank you. I went on longer than I should have. I, but uh, Brad, you're gonna, you have some uh, questions from the audience. Sure. Um, Senator, you mentioned the upcoming program on climate change. And interestingly, the biggest group by far of questions from this audience this evening dealt with climate change. Good. So here's one. I personally am angry at the Trump administration's response to the climate change report. Individually, I feel so helpless in reversing the effects of climate change. How do we make sure the representatives we elect are serious about combating climate change? Well, I, I am very happy that a lot of the questions deal with climate change. So let's be frank about this issue. First of all, the issue of climate change not unlike the issue of healthcare, 
not unlike the issue of Wall Street reform. Congressional policy has everything to do with the corrupt campaign finance system. All right, understand that. So what you got now, and, and I want you to think about it, because this really rests less in politics and more in psychiatry, and that is that you have a fossil fuel industry that has lied and lied and lied about the dangers of climate change. ExxonMobil knew this decades ago, what was going on, and they lied about it. So you have people out there who are willing to risk the future of this planet. We all saw the horror of what happened in California. We saw 85 people dead and probably more than that. 14,000 homes destroyed in an unprecedented fire. We see rising sea levels which are already impacting Alaska, Florida, and coastal regions all over the world. We have seen heat waves. And what these reports are telling us, that if the temperature of the planet continues to rise, it is going to be very hard for farmers in this country and other countries to grow the corn and the soybeans that they now do. We are facing a global crisis. And it is beyond comprehension, it really is, that we have a president of the United States and a fossil fuel industry that are prepared to reject science in order to profit the fossil fuel industry. So what our job is, what do we do? And here's, that's the bad news. Here is the good news. The good news is that despite Trump, we, and we're gonna discuss this at the climate change uh, town meeting on Monday night, that despite Trump, all over the world, there have been major breakthroughs in energy efficiency and sustainable energy. Cost of solar is going down. Cost of wind is going down. So instead of making it easier for gas guzzling cars to be on the road by reducing cafe standards, we have got to move, among other things, to the electrification of our transportation system. We've got to rebuild our rail system in this country. We got to weatherize our buildings, and in that we can save an enormous amount of energy and create millions of good paying jobs. So the good news is we know what to do, and that technology will only get better in years to come. But I beg of you, this is an issue that impacts not only you, but more significantly your kids and your grandchildren. What the scientists are telling us is that what happened in California, the wildfires there and all over the West Coast, this is not the exception to the rule. If we don't get our act together in a very bold way, that situation becomes even worse. And as custodians of the planet and people who love our kids and our grandchildren, man, we are gonna have to stand up take on the greed of the fossil fuel industry and transform our energy system away from fossil fuel. The next, the next question is about the DACA program, the Dreamers. As a DACA recipient, what's next for us? What's your ideal plan for legislation for Dreamers? What do you suggest for Dreamers who would like to pursue careers in politics? How can we be vocal without having fear? I will tell you, that is such a, tra everybody here knows that DACA is a program developed uh, by the Obama administration, which gave legal protection uh, to some 1.8 million young people. These are dreamers, who call them dreamers, people who were not born in the United States, came over uh, the border, but who essentially uh, know the United States as their only country. I will tell you that on some very important bills, which I thought were pretty good, I voted against that legislation because it did not provide legal protection to the dreamers. So for a start, the first and simple uh, answer, supported by the overwhelming majority of the American people, is to once again provide legal protection to the 1.8 million young people who are working, they are teaching, they're in the military, uh, or well, they're getting an education right now. They deserve that legal protection. And I cannot imagine 
the kind of fear and anxiety that so many of these young people experience when they lose their DACA status. They can walk out on the street. They can be stopped. They can be deported. How horrible is that? So we got to deal with that. We got to provide immediate legal protection. And I hope with the Democrats gaining control over the House, that process will begin. As you know, in the Senate, we did a few years ago pass immigration uh, reform. I think the House will now take that up. And uh, it is something that I think the American people want us to do and it's something that we must do. Uh, here's a rather broad question on foreign policy. Uh, where do you see a progressive foreign policy focusing in the next 10 years? Well, that will be a three hour discussion, y'all. <laughs> um, let me start on one very specific issue, which is very much on my mind, because I think I'm gonna have the bill on the floor of the Senate tomorrow. So I'm thinking about this a little bit. And that is, uh, as some of you may know, and some of you may not know, uh, right now uh, in Yemen, a very poor country of 28 million people, they are now facing the worst humanitarian crisis on earth today. Uh, we are talking about, as a result of the Saudi-led war in Yemen, over the last three years, 85,000 children have starved to death, and the United Nations tell us that there is a real threat to massive starvation and famine in that country. Uh, 10,000 new cases of cholera develop every single week, which lays the groundwork for people to die of easily prevented uh, diseases. And all of that has to do with the Saudi led war uh, in Yemen. And tomorrow, we have a resolution that I brought forth with Senator Mike Lee, who's a conservative Republican from Utah. And it essentially says that the United States, A, has got to end its participation in that war. And it is just stunning and hard to believe that we have a president of the United States and we have to end our participation because that war is being led by a despotic regime in Saudi Arabia where women are treated as third class citizens um, and uh, we should not be allied with them. And to have a president who says, oh, no problem, we're selling them $100 billion of military weapons. Of course we are going to be al allied with them is a disgrace to everything this country is supposed to stand for. So not surprisingly, uh, many in this audience would like to see you run for president again. So, so, so let me put the question this way. How close are you to deciding one way or the other? You know, on a serious note, look. Um, uh, you know, when you decide to run for president, uh, that is a very, very difficult decision for your family uh, and for your own life. Um, what I believe from the bottom of my heart is that it is absolutely, absolutely imperative uh, that Donald Trump not be elected president of the United States of America. And I'm going to do everything that I can to make certain that that does not happen. And to be honest with you, what I am doing right now is talking to people all over this country to get an assessment of whether they think that I am, in fact, the strongest candidate uh, to defeat uh, Trump. If we, you know, you know, there are other good candidates, Democrats, the number of my friends, people I've known for a long time, we're thinking of running and they're good people. And the issue is now is not ego. Uh, it is the understanding that we are in a pivotal moment in American history and we all got to work together. Uh, to save our democracy and to protect the middle class and to protect the planet and protect our children and so forth. So it's a hard decision, but I will tell you that I am thinking about it. 
uh, that we're reaching out to folks around the country. And if, you know, trying to be as objective as I can, uh, conclude that I am the strongest candidate uh, to take on and defeat Donald Trump, then I will do that. Uh, if not, then I won't. But we are in that process now of uh, reaching out and trying to make that determination. This, um, this, this ne next question is about housing. It is becoming increasingly difficult to find affordable, decent, safe, and sanitary housing nationwide. This challenge particularly affects young people. What do you believe can be done on a national level? Here's a radical solution. Build affordable housing. How's that? <laughs> All right. This is, you know, sometimes there are issues out there which are not discussed very much by media or discussed much in Congress. The issue of child care, for example. We have a major crisis in child care, affordable child care in this country. The issue of affordable housing is another issue. I go all over the country, and if you think it's just Washington, D.C., or Seattle, or New York City, don't kid yourself. It is rural parts of this country as well. So instead of giving a trillion dollars in tax breaks to the top 1%, let's start investing in affordable housing and putting people to work in this country, building that housing. So two, two more questions, Senator. This next one is on anti-Semitism. How has anti-Semitism in America changed in the past century, and how is it the same? Well, this, let me broaden that issue, because it's not just anti-Semitism, but let me just say this. I think that one of the impacts of Trump's rhetoric has been to, intentionally or not, kind of unleash a lot of repressed hatred that exists in this country. And it's not just uh, anti-Semitism, uh, it is racism, it is anti-Muslim uh, activity, it is misogyny, it is attacks on uh, transgender people and gay people. Um, and this is the number, as you know, of hate crimes that we have seen in recent years, not just the shooting in the synagogue or other terrible shootings that we have seen. They are on the rise. And we have got to work so very hard to combat all of that racism. I want you all to think for a moment. I mean, I know you all know this, but if you think back over the last hundred years, you think about what went on in this country. In Burlington, Vermont, in northern Vermont, a lot of folks in the early part of the century came over from Quebec, French Canadians came down. And literally in the 1920s in Vermont, there was discrimination, strong discriminations against French Canadians who were Catholics. Catholics were not able to get jobs in banks, if you can believe it. You all know the history of what we have done to the Native American people. You know what we've done with the, to the Asian people in terms of the Asian Expulsion Act. You know the discrimination against the Irish, Irish not wanted, the anti-Semitism that we've seen, the, the, the discrimination against the Italians and other people. That's what the history of this country has been about. And what we have got to do, and again, as I said earlier, what bothers me most about Trump, it's not only his terrible economic and health care policies, is that he is trying once again to divide us up. We have come a long way. Great people struggled to end those types of discrimination. We elected the first African-American president in the history of this country, okay? More and more women are succeeding in politics. All of that is right and good. And to have a president who is trying to get one group of people to hate another group of people and creating that kind of climate where that hatred can come out, that is unforgivable. So I think our job is to do everything that we can uh, to fight that type of hatred uh, and to bring our people uh, together. Okay, final, final question. Given all the terrible news we hear on a daily basis, the environment, national debt, income inequality, the news from the border, 
Is there anything in your opinion to be hopeful about? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I want you all to understand this. I've had the privilege of being all over this country. I've been to virtually every state in America. And I've spoken to groups like this, and in fact, large, larger groups. And there is, you have to appreciate, and what keeps me going, is the understanding there is so much beauty and decency in this country. I will never forget, you know, again, going back to my campaign, I was out in California, in the agricultural part of California, beautiful part, and seeing, doing rallies with young Latino kids and black kids and white kids, and people coming together. Do not think, I mean, what the media picks up maybe appropriately, all the ugliness that goes on, we want to know about the hate crimes. But do not, do not understand, do not fail to understand that there is a lot of love and decency in this country as well. And maybe that doesn't make the CBS evening news. So we have, and what we have got to do is figure out ways that we bring our people together. And as I've mentioned, I think the theme of tonight is that on all of these issues, should every American be entitled to health care as a right? The American people believe yes. Should workers earn decent wages? The American people believe yes. Should we take on the fossil fuel industry and protect our environment? The American people believe yes. Should we overturn Roe versus Wade? The American people believe no. Should we have comprehensive immigration reform? Yes. Criminal justice reform? Yes. So I'm not going to tell you that there are not divisions. There are. But on issue after issue, the American people actually share a common vision for the future of our country. But our job in the midst of all of this is to do something that is not easy. It really is not easy. And that is to take on a very small number of people, often billionaires, whose greed is negatively impacting not only our economy, but our political system as well. And I think when we bring our people together and when we have the guts to tell the fossil fuel industry and to tell the drug companies and to tell Wall Street that they cannot develop policies which hurt so many people. When we have the courage to stand up and fight back, man, there is nothing, nothing that we cannot accomplish. So I am optimistic about the future. Thank you all very much.